I'll start now. Uh, I'm Tom Perry. I'm actually in Boise, Idaho right now. And it looks like the video uh, Wi-Fi is working beautifully. So I'm going to try to, I'm going to show you two very challenging cases. And so I'm not going to waste too much time. We've, you've seen the learning uh, uh, objectives, but really it's, um, I ended up modifying and using one case that's completely outpatient work by a clinical pharmacist and one case that was mine from over 10 years ago in, in hospital to, to try to raise the question, uh, should we be doing more deprescribing in hospital? And I encourage humor. Uh, Adrian Montgomery now does uh, oncolo GP oncology in 100 Mile House, I think, but uh, she faced this and allowed me to use this picture. Uh, when I sent out the handout, uh, Dr. Martin Dawes, who's our former head of family practice at UBC, looked at it and sent me an email on, and then gave me permission to post his comment saying that even somebody uh, that eminent, uh, trained in Oxford, if I'm right, and who practiced in BC and became our head of the academic family to practice department, even he finds it, finds it still difficult to deprescribe. And partly it's making the decision and then getting the patient or their family to agree with it. And he gave an example very recently. He had tried to stop Zopicone in a nursing home patient and the daughter called and threatened him. So he comments, you know, or by deprescribing, are we implying that the initial prescriber was wrong? That's something to think about. And what about relatives, especially when they're more scared than the patient of stopping something? And one of his hints was maybe instead of asking or saying, we need to stop medications, we should ask, which one shall we stop? Um, let's look at the first case. So I tried to simplify in this man, a very, very complicated history so we can attempt to absorb it. And uh, well, first, uh, uh, Trudy Heigebert is a clinical pharmacist in Calgary in the University of Calgary Family Practice Clinic, she allowed me to use this case with the permission of the patient also. And she presented it in September in our deprescribing webinar series. I thought it was so interesting. It was a great case as a challenge to all of us. So the most serious medical issues from the point of some view of someone like me as an internist would be his interstitial lung disease, because it's probably it tends to be fatal. And then COPD added on that from long time smoking is pretty bad. And degenerative di disc disease has put him into a wheelchair, has a back pain, and then depression that was serious enough to be thinking of suicide. And the other issues, they're, they're typically important for people. But in this case, for example, osteoporosis, if you've been on bisphosphonates for a long time, it's, it's probably almost it's not going to kill you and there's not much you can do about it. So I put that into a, a lesser area just to try and give us a feeling for a complicated patient. We simplified as much as we could his physical exam. He's got low blood pressure for his age. He's de definitely dependent upon oxygen. And she found that he had, or the family doctor working with whom she works found generalized abdominal tenderness. And I'm about to show you a video. And his A1C is essentially normal. And fortunately, his uh, kidney function remains adequate. But the pharmacist points out there are multiple healthcare care involve, uh, providers involved, all of whom see it in from their own perspective. These are the people who actually did the work in this case, and we're going to challenge ourselves what we think of this. So this is what I sent you in advance, and hopefully I'm not the only person who finds this intimidating. And this is a chance if anyone wants to comment on this. Um, the colors are simply to divide drugs by indication. They're arbitrary colors or, or an attempt to figure out at least what was the likely indication for them. And this is what Trudy faced uh, assisting, I guess, on a salaried basis, her, the family doctor with whom she worked in Calgary with a man who was unhappy with drugs. I think what I'm going to do is I'll show you the video, what he looked like initially and come back to it. And uh, But he said, when she, when Trudy uh, asked him, you know, what are you hoping for? He said he didn't really know what, if anything, was working. And he was having diarrhea with fecal incontinence, and he had lost 32 kilograms in four months while taking semaglutide and empagliflozin, et cetera. He didn't even find it worth living, really. He said, uh, oh, I'm spending my whole life just taking pills now. So see what you make. You probably will have to turn your sound up. With all the conditions that I have, life sucks. There's so many drugs. I don't know what works, what doesn't work anymore. And I'm working with Trudy and Dr. Karim to try and figure all this out. I've got so much abdominal gas, abdominal cramps and pains. A mix between diarrhea and mush four months now and I went for colonoscopy and 
couldn't go through with it because there was too much stuff backed up yet. But I'm on so many drugs right now that I can't anymore tell what's working, what's not working. And my quality of life, there isn't one. It's basically existing. Over the last four weeks, we made a few changes to your medications. Some are working, some are not. I've gotten most of my appetite back. There are still some foods that taste off to me. I've gained a couple of pounds, which is I'm happy with. The changes are slow. Some have worked, some are not. We've made more changes today and we go from there. It's been really frustrating because Dave has so many issues going on. We're just hoping for a better outcome on the things we can change and the things that we do may have some control over. And that would be huge in, in, in just giving us some joy in life again. You know, there's gotta be a better way. Trudy's great, she's trying to, help, trying to help us the best that she can and hopefully something works. So I'm sorry about the sound. I hope you were able to hear it, but um, we're going to look at that list again. And I think if you, if you hit the reactions button, raise your hand. If you want to say something, unmute yourself. I noticed uh, Dr. Azif in the chat noted there were an awful lot of pain medications there. So this is what a uh, family doctor and clinical pharmacist faced, and it was uh, handed off to the clinical pharmacist to attempt to do something with it back in May of this year. I see Dr. Joel Norris is pointing out in chat that uh, he's overtreated and that semaglutide is <clears throat> overrated for diabetes and is a, a, an obvious potential or likely cause of some of his adverse effects. Dr. Uh, Jensen or Ginson says, um, wanted clarification on what was stopped. This is the initial one. And we'll, I'll show you in a moment what the pharmacist did, but I'm just wondering what uh, people would like to suggest. Dr. Azif says, he's, as a psychiatrist, he thinks he would have been able to contribute something, but you're welcome to. Is that you there? Go go ahead. Yeah, I mean, this is a very intimidating list for sure. And as the psychiatrist, again, you know, uh, I would obviously defer to the you know family doctor with regards to the majority of medications. But I would just say that given that there's so many pain medications and the patient himself sounded very defeated uh, and like a blunted affect almost, and uh, maybe even frustrated with uh, what he's dealing with, I just want to add that depression or feeling being in a state of depression can make pain perceptible was so I, I wonder if there's a you know if there's adequate management of his depression and suicidality I did not see the mention of a psychiatrist was being involved in the team who is treating him yeah that's an interesting comment I don't think there was I, I think she would have listed a psychiatrist who had there been but I know that uh, I discussed this case with the pharmacist Trudy Heigebert to develop it for our deprescribing webinar series. And I can tell you, I challenge her, you know, what, why is she on uh, three different trazodone, duloxetine, bupropion, potentially antidepressants? Uh, I'm not a believer that there's solid evidence for use of more than one drug at a time. But, and if so, it would be very uh, weak or low probability of success. But also duloxetine is higher than the approved indications and it's a high dose of bupropion. I don't want to say too much about bupropion because it's going to come up in one of the short snapper presentations later on this morning, including, I think, uh, a challenge to dose response in bupropion. But, uh, some of the other comments, some others are pointing out, well, you've got to start somewhere. So one, um, does anyone else want to speak out? If so, just unmute yourself. and. Um, yeah, thanks. This is an overwhelming list. But I guess the way I would look at it, the way that I've done this with other patients is first ask if there's medication that they know really bothers them. So get them start with their buy-in. We can look at that reverse cascade. Like what are the medications that have been added to treat the side effects of other medications? And sort of, I guess I'd probably focus on the GI symptoms. And if we can get, you know, stop the semaglutide, then that's going to improve nausea. Then maybe we can stop on donzitron, maybe decrease 
pain meds. So I think I'd focus on GI side effects. That would be my approach. But yeah, there's a huge number of meds that could be decreased here that are probably causing more uh, problems than good. I see maybe everyone else can see this, but in the chat, I see uh, at least one person has suggested wondering about cyclobenzaprine and baclofen. I presume partly because cyclobenzaprine is so powerfully anticholinergic, it would be an obvious cause of constipation and constipation can cause overflow diarrhea. Same with the semaglutide. It's pretty obvious one, right? Particularly with an A1C of uh, 6.1% and a weight loss of 32 kilograms. It, but it leaves you the question, well, what is the purpose of empagliflozin then? And is empagliflozin safe or not? Uh, there's some risks to it. And if he doesn't have established heart disease, which is the context in which empagliflozin is proven to reduce cardiovascular events, and even death, or he doesn't have heart failure, um, is it essential? Anyone else want to comment on this? I think the key thing I'm bringing up is presumably most of the people who are participating have seen some kind of a crazy list like this. And um, go ahead, whoever wanted to speak. Jim, Jim Howie. And then I'm more concerned about his overall pain type of medications, like the oxycodone plus the oxycodone IR to me, is especially when he's got chronic back pain. Yes, he's got general disc disease, but that's not a treatment for back. I mean, that, that's a high, relatively high dose, probably with minimal return. And it's hypertensive. So he probably doesn't need both hypertension. Yeah, because his blood pressure was something like, um, it was 102 systolic. Um, Dr. Dawes, I think you raised your hand. Yeah. Um, so this is a challenging case. And and I would step back a little bit and say, well, what do you want to achieve? It, what's the what's your uh, disease or the problems you're facing uh, preventing you from doing? Because sometimes there are unrealistic expectations and sometimes there are things that can be achieved without any change to the medication. Um, and I think understanding what he and his wife want to do uh, would be really quite helpful. But then you got down to the practical level of, well, still, how do I start? And I think the strategy of choosing one of the issues, and we talked about the pain, the diabetes, the hypertension, the another way of looking at it is which drugs are going to cause interactions and the QTC interval prolonging drugs are, are another way, a strategy of, of, of approaching it. But, but I like the idea of saying, well, we're going to look at the hypertension, or we're going to look at the diabetes, or we're going to look at the pain. And picking one of those off, uh, one of those problems off uh, at a time seems a logical approach. Which one depends on which they would prefer to do, I think. Thank you. Dr. DeBoer, you wanted to say something, I think? It's giving a thumbs up to Dr. Dawes, because, yeah, I agree. Like, what what are their primary goals? What do, what do they want to accomplish? What are the, you know, the activity to daily living that they, they would like to achieve and then try targeting around that? So he wanted really, I went back to that slide, but I think partly he, he was very troubled by back pain and he was very troubled by having way too many pills. And then the single most important thing was presumably the humiliation of having fecal incontinence and constantly feeling bloated or constipated as well. So uh, let me just, uh, Dr. Howie, I think pointed out, you know, you could, I think that this is quite an interesting issue. You could look at the uh, oxycodone or opioid in, in several ways, and you could apply that also to duloxetine and bupropion and cyclobenzaprine. Does a high dose mean, or relatively high dose mean that it's working? Or could it also mean, no, it never really worked, so the dose got increased? And especially if we now know that recent clinical trials seem to show actually opioids mm -hmm. don't work well for any kind of back pain which still puzzles me. I, I prescribed a lot of opioids for severe pain for people, and I wouldn't personally s still be ashamed to prescribe an opioid for this man if he said it really helps my back pain. But of course, I'd be worried about constipation. And then I, th I, I think what I'm getting at is all of us probably know, but it, we need reinforcement that you've got to start somewhere. It could be with logic like, well, QT prolongation drugs, if you know those well or are willing to look them up, I don't claim to know them that well, but on Doncitron is obviously one, maybe Trazodone. I don't know what else on there, but that would be a place to start, which would be safety. Another would be if he's already got lung problems, anything that suppresses ventilation is not going to be very good. So it's always a reason to worry about opioids, right? And another one would be balance issues like pregabalin, maybe opioids, anything that don't show alertness like cyclobenzaprine. And then another place to start would be constipation, which would be, you know, iron, I think iron is an actually an easy one because it's never urgent, or if it were ever urgent, the best treatment would be intravenous iron. 
And the great thing about intravenous iron, despite the expense, is that it's now very safe. One dose fixes you for a year or longer. Uh, well, one one treatment at least. So if you're worried about uh, adverse effects of iron, you know, there's never a reason to keep it going on. Yes, uh, Joe Norris, go ahead. I was going to say another, I think we're all seeing this, but looking at, oh, it looks like you're on things for constipation, but you're also on things for diarrhea and you're on things that cause nausea and things that, you know, you got, you're on a pro-motility uh, with a metoclopramide, but then you're on, you know, some meglutide, which decreases the motility and the narcotics. And you're on propion, which uh, keeps you up, but then you're on trazodone, pregabalin, back, like other things that are to help you go to sleep. So bringing, noticing that with the patient and talking about, that just might help clarify which ones to hit first and just see how sort of nonsensical in some ways our medication list can get as we add medication after medication to treat side effects. Thank you. I just want to go back to one thing Dr. Azif mentioned was that he looked like he might have a flat affect. And this will relate to the second case I'm going to show you in video, but also to the the second video, the follow-up video of this man, which when I uh, I was editing these for Trudy, the pharmacist, and I thought, you know, when in the second one, he's got his mask off. To me, he looked quite Parkinsonized, perhaps, or alternately, one could say he's got a flat affect from depression. So I, I asked her, um, you know, what do you think? Is there anything there, any dopamine blocker there that's causing him? When somebody's behind a mask, you don't have very much to go on. You're re- all, all you're really left with is their eyes in a video interview. But I tend to also look at things like metoclopramide is probably not nearly as an effective a drug as we think it is. It's recently been shown not to be very effective for delayed gastric emptying. And for nausea, if you really start talking to patients and listening to them, it may be that the akathisia it causes is, is worse than nausea. <laughs> so I think medical permit should always be challenged because it can also cause tardive dyskinesia. And let me ask, is any, was anyone other than me? Well, I wasn't. Is anyone aware that medical permit causes depression? Because I wasn't ever until a patient taught me that. And the patient learned it from a lay counselor who looked up medical permit on the internet. Uh, the woman had severe tardive dyskinesia and um, from metoclopramide, but also had depression. Once the metoclopramide was stopped, the depression reverted. And if you think that one through and you believe that dopamine contributes to feeling wonderful highs, whether we're in love or we're taking a stimulant or whatever, then blocking dopamine could be expected to cause depression, right? I'm just, I think I'll move on and just show you what he looked like and what the pharmacist did. Or right, here's what she did. So she stopped seven drugs, including many of those that have been mentioned, and she reduced oxycodone, starting with the controlled release, and duloxetine, and iron and calcium, et cetera. And then she had to put back uh, duloxetine, he objected, and so that really helps my back pain. I think he felt, I forget if it was depression or back pain or both. Would have surprised me, but she went with his, with the patient's view rather than mine. And he wanted a cyclobenzaprine vet, which to me is uh, an awful drug, but I wouldn't want to take it, but he wanted it. And then she simplified one thing from six capsules a day of pregabalin had somebody had prescribed it in a small dose to at least let's make it just two capsules a day. But by doing what she did, she saved, I, I challenge her, what about looking up the price of the drug? She saved over $6,000 a year to the Alberta taxpayer. Or the, and uh, somebody in chat is saying that medical program are more likely to penetrate the CNS, what then, than uh, Domperidone, I think. So not surprising. Yeah. So let's see what you look like the second time. Again, unfortunately, you'll probably have to turn up your sound we have been at this for about five months yeah. and so we just wanted to hear what your thoughts are one of the things you said when you came in i don't know what's working and i don't know what's not it's been very he's up and about again this past weekend we went camping with our daughter and his her family it was so enjoyable yeah. just just freedom it's out into nature it, it takes away everything from in here and I can just go uh, brain dead, as they say, <laughs> not think about anything. And I think part of it, being able to do that, is thanks to Trudy and Dr. Karim and the deprescribing, because he was on so much, and, and, it, and he still is. But as he said, now we have more of a more insight as to what what what's actually helping us and what was dragging us down and it's it's a journey but um it was worth taking it was a journey worth taking 
Many thanks to our fearless farmers. So just before I come to this, there's a question in the chat uh, from Marison Morward about metoclopramid in palliative care and which uh, antiemetics might be preferable. I don't know. I, I used to be afraid of ondansetron, and it was very expensive when it was brought out, but I've never run across anyone who's had a problem with ondansetron. Whether it works as well as we think it does, that's always another question. And pure CBD, if it worked, would probably be pretty safe, but you would know better than I Dr. Morwood, whether it works well in that situation. But metoclopramide, the thing is that it works by causing dopamine blockade in the same way haloperidol does. So if you assume that somebody's going to potentially look like, if, or if you're uh, able to question somebody sensitively about whether they feel restless or anxious or kind of desperate inside, which is akathisia, that, that would be the safest way to use such drugs and expect it's going to happen, probably. If you look at the Therapeutics Initiative website and look at letter 139, no, letter 142, 139 or 142, one of them is about dopamine antagonists and finally gave me a chance to post some videos I had collected for many years that show movement disorders from dopamine antagonists, including metoclopramide. And there's a beautiful description by a young woman of how horrible it was to get metoclopramide for severe migraine. These are some I felt, you know, I would have started on like iron potentially causing constipation and, and maybe nausea too. And it's never necessary urgently. It's often necessary, but an intravenous iron, I happen to be a great fan of in the right circumstances. So had he been iron deficient, I might've said, look, let me just give you a course of injections and let's fix it. And calcium, the same thing. Like the, I think most of us know the utility of oral calcium, other than perhaps in severe hypocalcemia is almost nil or is nil. Uh, vitamin D may be the same thing. Emphagoflozin, because he's not even really diabetic anymore. He's lost so much weight, perhaps from the semaglutide or and, you know, I wouldn't personally tackle the monoclonal antibody because I don't know that evidence. I don't have power. The respirologist has put him on it. The fact that it's very expensive is going to make him believe it's essential to his life. As an internist, it would be hopeless to challenge that. That's the respirologist problem. And the uh, same with in COPD. I'm not going to touch the inhalers in a guy who's on oxygen. It's just, but acetaminophen at very high dose it turns out even at 3,000 milligrams per day, some people get liver disease from this. And like you, I went after a lot of these cyclobenzaprine and pregabalin, which also might contribute to depression. That's just my personal bugbear. You know, I'm not a great believer that these are tremendously powerful. I'd, I'd rather turn him over to Dr. Aziz and let Dr. Aziz give him some sympathetic interviewing. And then, and then does any proton pump inhibitor ever have to be at double the dose? Or is that more of a recognition that the reflux is not acid, it's just stomach content coming back? The next case is, here's how he looked at the time Trudy had finished with him a few weeks ago. I don't know. He's not got the friendliest expression on his face, but she said, the pharmacist says that's just him. And he's much happier. So I think hopefully everybody can agree she did a beautiful job here, and it may be a strong argument for a salaried clinical pharmacist, for doctors sometimes to turning over power and responsibility, saying, oh, I guess if I had that opportunity, I would think, yeah, if Trudy was willing to work with my patient, fine, it's your problem for the next few months. You take responsibility and use me as backup, which is now possible in British Columbia from these primary care pharmacists uh, network and so on. But there, there's the pharmacist. And she said, I think one of her big issues was, yeah, well, what would, what would you like to try if, you're, if we're going to do something, which would you suggest perhaps, and just keep in touch with him a lot. And she, interestingly, even in a complex case like this, she thinks we should be asking, you know, for example, would, would empagoflows and evidence that's positive for some people apply to him in his state with interstitial lung disease and severe COPD? Almost certainly not, I would think. Perhaps we can come back to this uh, before we wrap things up. Um, what would stop you? Where she succeeded with him a lot, what would stop us? Maybe we can come back to that. But I really want to show you this, because this is an example of a, a really different approach that would not be suggested in deprescribing algorithm, algorithms, which all tend to be, from my point of view, very hesitant and all, perhaps ineffectual. And when you think about it, why does somebody end up recognizing, well, a 25% dose reduction? Why 25% rather than 23% or 20% or 33%? It's, it's always going to be arbitrary. Arbitrary. And if it's a committee that did it, it's going to be, well, our meeting is run overtime now. What are we going to agree on? If you think about that, it's 
it's liberating. So this is a woman who was hospitalized for uh, allegedly for alcohol withdrawal at an advanced stage on a Labor Day weekend when I had to cover two wards at Vancouver General Hospital and the house staff were away for a couple of days and the students. So I said to myself, the cat's away, the mice will play. I can do anything I want without having to argue with junior people who don't know as much about medicine or drugs as I do, but think they know more which is potentially any of us who have, you know, we're beyond an educational license or even people who are in training. And what really, I'm not going to discuss these drugs on the right, you know, calcium carbonate. I didn't care. Let her family doctor deal with this. You'll see why I focused on these. There's clearly very high doses of drugs and there was no indication that she had schizophrenia or bipolar disease. It was presumably depression or possibly insomnia. Take a look at what she looked like. Uh, again, you may have to turn up your sound. I, I feel out of it. Can you explain what the sensation is? Well, I feel a little bit dizzy and dazed. A little bit, still a little of nausea here. And just terribly weak. I feel like just collapsing on the floor. I feel so weak, I have to do this. I understand that. Maybe you could explain to me what these are for, if you, if you know. I know because I can read on them. Mm-hmm. It says oval brown pill. That's probably it for moods. Mertazepine. Do you have any opinion on what it does? Well, I think it probably lifts my mood because I'm often naturally sort of depressed and and it's, um, I seem to feel peppier. Maybe that's not it. But the next one is um, PMS. Q did a did a pain, 300 milligrams. I think relax me so that I sleep better because I've had. Uh, she has insomnia. Do you know anything more about that drug, uh, catiapine? No. No. Do you have schizophrenia? I didn't think so. Maybe I do. Would it surprise you if I told you that drug is officially approved in Canada for uh, psychosis and schizophrenia? My goodness. None of these I definitely need. It's Zopaclone. Okay. The next one, take two tablets in the morning and one in the evening. It's Lyrica. He told me those pills were for pain. Where was the pain that they were supposed to treat? What part of your body? Just stop and think. Oh, I have various aches and pains. Do you periodically sort of stop to ask yourself, I wonder which one of these I really like and which one I don't like? Or not? About drugs? Yeah. No, I think if I had to choose, it would be my sleeping pills. Because I have such trouble with insomnia. Am I the first person to ask you this much detail about your pills? I feel out of So here's your turn. It's a hospital setting where one has 24-hour day observation, and it's a Labor Day weekend, and it's Saturday morning. That the house staff will return on Tuesday, and then somebody else whose name is on her wrist will take over the care. So you've got up to three days. And my strategy was if I'm going to do anything, I want her discharged on Tuesday morning before anybody else gets into the picture. I'll dictate the summary and write the order for Tuesday morning. (laughs) Well, as the psychiatrist in the room, um, quetiapine can be, it ranges all the way to 1,000 milligrams. For schizophrenia, usually the doses are between 500 and 1,000. Uh, for bipolar, it's between 300 to, I guess, 500. At lower doses, up to 200, even 300 is used for insomnia and anxiety. Uh, however, you know, and it's a low potency antipsychotic. It's not associated with stark EPS because again it's only at a higher dose it will be a dopamine blocker uh, anyhow but you know in the grand scheme of things with her dizziness it could cause orthostatic hypotension as well uh, I would you can do a pretty rapid taper uh, you can go up to around 200 milligrams a day cut down or initiation so yeah you can, I would do 
reduce first and then gradually discontinue the quetiapine. Mirtazapine, yes, it's probably being given for mood. At lower doses, it would help with sleep. At higher doses, it would help with depression and anxiety. I would just leave that as it is. I don't I don't think it's causing major issues in her case. The Zopiclone would be my biggest concern, followed by the pregabalin can balance issues. And if she's presenting for alcohol withdrawal, seeing tremors or uh, um, imbalanced gait or whatnot, I'm assuming I would work on reducing that. I'm not sure if you could just stop at cold turkey. Zopiclone for sure, you know, I, I mean, uh, she's really attached to it. I can see why, but at the same time, you know, has its own set of issues. Anyone else want to comment? Um, Duke Sally Ginson says her speech seems slurred. I'm glad you commented on that. I, I hope most people recognize that she, even if you've never met her before, she's probably Parkinsonist. Uh, she's got very little facial expression. And in the presence of dopamine antagonists, I think it's a bad mistake to say flat affect. In fact, I don't think the term flat affect should be used at all. I, I've taught my students for at least 15 years ban it from your vocabulary, like ban the, the psychobabble term endorsing symptoms. Say there doesn't seem to be any facial expression and then ask yourself, is that natural Parkinsonism, drug-induced Parkinsonism or sadness, which in the, in the first case, the phar clinical pharmacist thought it was clearly sadness, depressed affect, if you want to call it that. But it can be a trap if you say it's flat affect, you think it's depression as opposed to a masked facies, which was the old-fashioned nomenclature for Parkinsonism. I'm not seeing anyone else who wants um, to come. Um, so uh, it's Martin. I, you know, I put in the chat earlier, we used to bring in patients who are on these sorts of polypharmacies and, and just stop everything cold turkey. It was pretty effective. It was a safe experience because the patient was in a hospital, wouldn't counsel it at home. But I think if you've got them in Vancouver General, there's nothing I would say that would stop me from saying, I'm going to stop all of these um, over the next, you know, and then you've got three days or two nights to, to monitor the effect and see what happens. And I know that's pushing it a little bit to say stop everything, but I thought you just needed someone in this conversation to say stop everything. Oh, well, thank you, Martin. Can I ask uh, if anyone may be entering the chat, if you think that's irresponsible or absurd, what Dr. Doss just said, just explain why in the chat. Because I agree, we were taught to do that. And during most of my, I, I no longer practice in hospitals since 2014, but even up to 2014 at the, I had the ability to admit someone as an internist and clean them up. And I did. And uh, when, you, if you think about when you see her in a moment, the, the value of that to the patient society, even economically to the taxpayer, it can be profound if you do a good job of it. I'm going to advocate now that um, with uh, Martin Doe's, we should be doing that more. So, okay, well, these are questions for you, but uh, key one is I wouldn't allow anyone to do this to my partner, my parent, or my child, but I'd make too many enemies if I tried to do something about it. But, you know, a very bad answer would be, I don't have time. And I discovered over time that I could do it even outside the hospital if I was prepared to provide my pager number to the patient and sometimes my email. So, you know, please don't call after 11 o'clock at night when I go to sleep. If you want to call up till 11, that's fine. Call anytime if you're worried and almost never got called. This is an alternative of how I looked at it. She's markedly impaired. Her health is at risk from a variety of different reasons. She'd be a lot better off without all this junk. The family doctor in this case may not like me. He's not around for the weekend, long weekend I am. If she turns out much better, the family doctor might forgive me. That, that's the risk I took in that particular case. It might have been more gracious to telephone and ask, but in fact, it was impossible. I wouldn't have reached him on a Saturday. So this is what I did. I, I compromised with her because she said, oh, that one I really need. The pregabalin, it took actually much longer than the video makes it appear when I asked her, where's the pain? She couldn't come up with any answer. The cotyvine, I thought she's Parkinsonized. I'm just getting rid of that. I don't think when I've analyzed the uh, evidence for cotiapine or other antipsychotics for depression. It's it's underwhelming. If, if you're interested in that, we did a therapeutics letter on that entitled antipsychotics should not be used for non-psychotic depression. And the bottom line is that they probably make people sleep better because they're soporifics. So on our depression rating scale, sleep is important. That's probably the main difference between adding an antipsychotic. And the mirtazapine, I didn't dare cut it down completely because I, I didn't I didn't want too many nursing calls. She's got, gotten, she can't sleep. But uh, this is what happened. You stopped taking the Seroquel or Ketiapine? Yes. yes. 
And you also stopped taking the Lyrica, yes, which is also called pregabalin. And you had put on it, it was useless, probably useless. Have you noticed any difference since you stopped those? I feel very much better. Can you describe what the difference is? Well, for one thing, um, I feel more cheerful. Not just physical for things, but I feel more cheerful, and that's one of the things that's made me realize that something's different because I used to be rather serious and sober all the time and now I feel happy and g good. Do you think there's any difference in the clarity of your thinking? Maybe there is, you know, I, I don't think about what I think. The last 10 days you haven't been using any alcohol, right? No. And is there any difference to your dizziness? Yeah, it, or? it is better. One of the big issues was you said you weren't sleeping well. That's uh, definitely better. It has definitely been better. Even though you stopped taking some drugs? Yeah, drugs. even though I stopped taking some things. Well, I, I think you look different in a positive way. That's good. You're a very beautiful woman. Thank you. You're welcome. So if there are any younger people who are offended by that, in fact, some women of this age appreciate a compliment like that. It's not, they don't consider it sexist or offensive, but there was a particular reason I did that also, which uh, I'm, see if I can just play you that last bit once again. You stop taking it. Just watch her face when I said that to her and particularly watch dimples and around her mouth. That's one of the things that's made her. One of the big issues was you said you weren't sleeping well. That's uh, definitely better. It has definitely been better. Even though you stopped taking some drugs? Yeah, days. even though I stopped taking some things. Well, I, I think you look different in a positive way. That's good. You're a very beautiful woman. Thank you. You're welcome. See how she dimpled there, and she obviously has much more expression, right? And for, if, for any of you who are in teaching roles, uh, in whatever profession you're in, um, if you have students around, it's uh, one thing I really recommend is using a mobile phone uh, to capture something. For example, if you think somebody might be quite Parkinsonized and you're not sure if they'll give you permission, even on a tentative basis, to record it and uh, record them again later, you've got something extremely valuable for teaching. Even if you're only, uh, I don't mean this disparagingly, uh, even if if you're only in a situation where you've got to say a resident or a student attending in a family practice office, or you're a non-academic psychiatrist but has students occasionally, it's an extremely valuable resource to be able to show someone because you can't always produce it on any given day. And, uh, also, if anyone's interested in presenting a case in our prescribing webinars, I'm trying to get everyone to get video of the patient before and after where, where there's something that might be interesting to see. It's a bit trickier to do that to capture orthostatic hypotension. It's possible. No, I think we are uh, got about a little over five minutes. So there's actually some time to exchange ideas. Um, but if you picked up any, it might be worth entering them in chat or just speaking to them. And also what barriers constrain you? Like I was surprised and I asked Dr. Martin Dawes if I could use his, his email quotation because even the former head of a major department at UBC feels intimidated sometimes about deprescribing. Um, would anyone like to comment now? Dr. Dawes says handwriting is possibly a safer recording than a phone for Parkinson's. As in, you mean you would get a sample of the patient's handwriting? Uh, yeah, it's uh, you just get them to write their address or uh, any phrase, and then you get them to repeat that. It's it's a fairly coarse tool. Uh, it's not as as it doesn't capture everything. But it, at least it's it's there and you can look back at it over the years um, and you can see the changes with various therapies. It just if you're recording patients faces, um, I'm pretty anxious about that and, and encouraging students and residents when they haven't got the uh, the safety bit around that process. Uh, it, it could be a problem. So I would want the university or the, you know, the college to be a little bit, you know, to be involved in whether we can just take a video of a patient's face uh, or them walking and then on our phone without sort of some security process around it. Yeah, that's a good point. We I checked because we wanted to use uh, videos in our deprescribing webinars and also in order to post them with a couple of therapeutics letters. I, I had been terrified of that thinking, 
I may do, I may be entirely ethical. I've got clear consent from the patient, but UBC will dump on me or a hospital with which I'm affiliated. Someone's going to penalize me. And I called uh, Canadian Medical Protective Association and the College of Physicians. I forget which one referred me to UBC, University of BC's legal service. And all of them ended up agreeing, no, it's ethical as long as you've explained to the patient, clearly put no pressure on the patient and also giving the patient the right to say no at any time. So no matter how much work I put into editing videos, if in this case, I got permission from the surviving three children of the woman you just saw in writing. And they were, I found it, I was quite surprised actually that when there's a lesson that might benefit other people, almost nobody says no. But, you know, everyone has to answer that for oneself. It's, if anyone wants it, it's uh, easy for me to provide you the consent form I design, designed after talking to UBC lawyers and, and others, which is similar to Canadian Medical Protective Association. And the College of Physicians rule, as you know, you have to be very clear to the patient that you're putting no pressure on them. You're going to give them equally good care, even if they say no. Dr. Howie points out that a lot of people coming into hospice can go back to long-term care, which is similar to a case presented in in our deprescribing series from Edmonton in uh, June. Very important point. And uh, Dr. DeBoer is uh, saying, oh, what about stopping things called turkey? Uh, and also, did I know what had been prescribed to help her cope with her drinking? I don't think anything had been. And she stayed sober for quite a while and did well for a couple of years and died around three years after that. But I, I never saw her again. She uh, do you want to speak, Doctor? Uh, sorry, I'm actually a, a registered nurse working. I'm a nurse oh. practitioner, so um, I work in um, like homeless and addictions population. And it's always just interesting, like when you see people in their current living environment when they're on substances. And so I guess the the, the thought and, and not a criticism, just kind of like the concept of like when you see them in the hospital when they've been sober. Okay, yeah, easy to easy to clean them up. But we had a guy who would go to the hospital, clean up, he'd present great, he'd go home, he'd decompensate, and so just kind of curious, um, you know, the age idea of like de-prescribing something when they're sober, just like, okay, when they're drinking and they're not functioning and that's their normal level, like they don't plan on quit drinking. Some of those medications may be the GP prescribed to, you know, when you're drinking and you're depressed, well, if I give you something to boost your mood while you're still using the alcohol, it's ethically complicated, but I, I just, just wanted to throw out that idea of, you know, what has been given. Like we had a guy who uses uh, methamphetamine. So the doctor would give him melanzapine to bring him down. But as soon as he stopped using the meth, he was tired all the time, but partially from withdrawal, but also it's like, okay, how much is the olanzapine, you know, bringing him down as well? Uh, in a deep prescribing workshop, we did two years ago, uh, and again this year for nurse practitioners in BC, I asked them to develop their own cases and work with them to present cases in a, in a much longer workshop. And all of the NP cases involved drugs and alcohol. And it just made me, I thought being an internist was a hard job, but it, my daughter's an NP and it really brought it home to me. Oh my God, that is a very tough job, but so you do the best you can. I mean, in this woman, I think probably the biggest single thing was stopping alcohol, but also the quetiapine was probably prescribed either for sleep or in, in the belief it was an adjunctive treatment or for depression. And when you see what she's like without those drugs and without alcohol, you know, she's a normal remarkably good 85 year old who had low education but was reading the new yorker magazine in the waiting room there's someone uh, uh svetlana skobkareva says um, having family members on board really helps definitely i think all of us have probably had that experience that uh and often they're the ones who are just incredibly grateful finally someone's willing are you a physician uh, or a nurse or a nurse practitioner or pharmacist Family doc, yeah. And Yona Marek or Jonah Marek is saying it's challenging to deprescribe when you're under pressure to, to give SGLT2 inhibitors, GLP1 or and ACE inhibitors. I mean, I think most of us would agree ACE inhibitors very seldom cause significant adverse effect. So that's one of the ones I, even if I don't think they're indicated to doing any good, I would be less worried about. If they cause a dangerous effect, like the hypersensitivity reaction and difficulty breathing, you know, they're gone and the patient is going to be labeled as allergic. But I don't find personally that they frequently cause postural hypotension. And cough, usually people have moved on then to an A2 blocker or something, rightly or wrongly. But I'm just looking back to see if there are any comments I've missed that we should discuss. Or Gloria said, I agree with stopping everything. This is the second case. Given all the chemical buildup, it would give her liver and kidneys a break. Stop to stop in the buildup in brain and other body systems. That also comes up to the question uh, about tapering or not. 
not everybody has to be tapered. Some people undoubtedly should. Certainly opioids, uh, you're going to probably produce withdrawal and venlafaxine, paroxetine, some antidepressants, it's probably almost inevitable. Other stuff, not. Benzos, maybe it's always, but we've probably all had patients who stopped Zopico on our benzos, cold turkey, and did not withdraw. And I, my experience with gabapentin pregabalin is it's very rare to see that or tricyclics. So I think we have to stop. I'd just like to thank everyone for participating and, and participating in a lively way. And um, there's one last comment, discussing sealing doses with the patient that the majority of people don't get benefit after certain doses can be effective. Great comment, right? Because it's true for almost all drugs that the maximum value for money occurs at the low end of the dose range. And if we can remind ourselves that it's it's not logical to keep increasing the dose if it doesn't seem to be working, that's actually quite illogical. Even though if you look at other people's records, maybe even at our own records, we do it all the time. Okay, thanks very much.